Portions of this podcast may not be suitable for children. It's real-life stories and sometimes PG-13. Great hearts can only be made by great troubles. Great faith must have great trials. Charles Spurgeon. You're listening to the Think Twice TV podcast. Hear true life stories, portable insight, and engaging messages. On this show, we'll think twice about life, faith, and just what could be possible when the two are combined. Broadcasting from the beautiful Great Lakes state of pure Michigan, here's your host, Dan Henderson. Hey, thank you for joining us on the Think Twice TV podcast. Pastor Richard Wormbrand said, A faith that can be destroyed by suffering is not a faith at all. He would know he was imprisoned in the cruel communist Russian prison for many years. He suffered various forms of torture, including solitary confinement for years at a time. Though tested, he never lost his faith. Today's episode is entitled Healings Happen, and we're going to look at some encouraging stories uh, about people's lives who have been changed through divine healing. Yes, I did say divine healing. Now, I'm not a Benny Hinn kind of guy, but in the case of Dennis, something truly unexplainable happened. Dennis Clanton is a pastor in the Michigan area. He was born with a very serious disorder. His doctors didn't give much of a chance at life, but doctors aren't always right. Let's listen to Dennis's story. Uh, my story, my testimony is one of, of God's grace and, and healing. Really, I was um, born severely crippled with a rare disease called the extrophy of the bladder, which simply meant that uh, from the waist down, my body did not develop and knit together. So for the first few years of my life, my organs were on the outside of my body. They were able to break my hips when I, were five, when I was five years old and turn them around and then to bring some knitting to the body. But that didn't stop the series of infections that were taking place. And um, so I ended up having to have a colostomy. And the colostomy enabled me to live into my teenage years. And growing up, growing up with a colostomy was a real challenge, especially if you're going to a country public school and people don't understand and you really don't understand. And your parents are just trusting God from one day to the next day. Uh, when I was 13, I was fortunate enough to be introduced into the Emory Healthcare Center. And um, there they performed a surgery on me that reversed the colostomy and gave me a better chance of living. At 16 years old, I really believed that God had called me to preach the gospel. I didn't know what that meant. I just knew that there was this sense that God was calling me to, to preach the gospel. I shared that with my pastor. He encouraged me, but <clears throat> we shared that with a, another man that he respected. And he just didn't feel like physically that I was capable of being able to to pastor or preach or hold the demands and I ended up yielding to that call and going to to Bible college to study for the ministry and it was while I was there that uh, I began dating the girl that I would loved all my life and um, asking her to marry me. It probably would be helpful to know for people who are processing or going through recovering and getting better was I had been told by my doctors that I wouldn't live past 21 and that um, I should never even think about getting married. I shared with her everything that had been going on in my life. Of course, she knew she was a childhood friend. And uh, after we got married, with her parents' blessings and my parents' blessings, her parents told us something that they had never told us. Her dad was a pastor, and everywhere they had pastored, they had taped our names up under the altar because they believed, since we were children, that God had meant for us to be together. They never encouraged us to date or anything of that nature, but they kept our names under the altar of the church as they pastored. And after we were married, they showed us that and how they kept our Isn't that cool uh, to have that story in your life? Well, we began our ministry after college, and believe it or not, there's one more story like that. My folks, the night I was born, when the doctors told them I was going to die, uh, that I wouldn't make it, they were praying, and they felt like the Holy Spirit had impressed upon them that I would live and I would grow up and preach the gospel, but they never told me that until after I began my ministry and after Becky and I were married. And so that just kind of affirmed us and encouraged us. And God has been so good to me. He's allowed me the opportunity to share in many different denominations in many countries. He's allowed me to share with medical students and to speak to the classes. He's also given me the opportunity to pray with people. 
And I wish I could tell you everybody I prayed for got healed. I don't understand why God doesn't heal everybody, but the fact that everybody isn't healed shouldn't surprise us because not everybody that Jesus met did He heal. My encouragement to people that because you're not healed today, don't give up hope. I went through 35 major surgeries and I'm healthier today at 60 than I was at 17. I just actually enjoy better health and am stronger and sounder because of what God has done. Dennis really is an amazing guy and I was so glad to sit down with him. You can follow him on his Twitter handle uh, at Dennis Clanton or check the show notes for links. Our next story is from Julie. She's an educator, mother, and mentor to many foreign exchange students. She tells us about the time her child was healed and, for lack of a better word, became a medical anomaly. Let's listen in now. It was in the winter time, about December, when we discovered that my daughter was very sick. She had a very high fever, lethargic, laying on the floor, crying. It was terrible. The doctor finally told us she also had an infection of her kidneys. And he says, I want her to go to the emergency room right now. And the doctor said she needs IV antibiotics right away because it can hurt her kidneys. So we did. And she got better. And the next month it happened again. And for the next seven to eight months it happened again every month because she had what was called a reflux where the urine refluxes up back into her kidneys and it caused a serious infection that could damage your kidneys if you don't take care of it. So every month we would go to the doctor, go to the emergency room sometimes, get antibiotics through the IV, and we really were getting tired of this process. But God kept reassuring us that he was with us. And the doctor finally said, she's going to need surgery soon. You can't have surgery with infection. The doctor says, let's start her on this antibiotic. We will uh, send it to the lab again. And I was just crying out to God. I said, God, please touch my baby. And he did. He touched her. And I didn't understand she was getting better that time. And then I got a phone call in the morning. The doctor said, I don't understand this. Your daughter is the talk of the office because they don't understand it either that the bacteria stopped growing and it reversed itself. How can that be possible? And the doctors were blown away. They don't know how that can be possible. The doctor said, stop the antibiotic. She doesn't have an infection right now. And we just rejoiced. I was just so, so relieved. God gave us the reassurance to know that he is with us. The Lord is near. And he will be with you, no matter what. Our next story is from Claudia, who has since passed away. But her story is about different amazing healings that she saw in her lifetime. Let's listen to Claudia's story about miracle memories. A woman once made the statement to me that she found it illogical to believe in God. And I replied that it would be illogical not to believe. She asked me why, and this was my response. Science cannot explain miracles. As a child, my sister Amy was born deaf and with her legs out of socket. She had congestive heart failure and my mom was told she would not live past two years old. But she could hear, run, and ride a bike as God healed her, all without surgery. At the age of 15 years old, I began suffering serious abdominal pain. For one year, doctors couldn't find anything and they said it was all in my head. Then on an examination, a doctor found something. Further testing revealed what they thought was a cyst on my left fallopian tube that protruded into my intestines. The treatment was hormone therapy to shrink the cyst, but on the follow-up ultrasound, the abnormality had grown three centimeters. The doctor said this amount of growth indicated that this was not a cyst, but a cancerous tumor. In the meantime, God put me in a deep sleep and I passed the tumor. My doctor was not convinced and did another ultrasound. She said all that remained was scar tissue, and she wanted to know what hospital had performed the surgery. God would go on to heal me of viral meningitis with encephalitis, heal my son Zachary of severe asthma, and my son Nicholas of an itching disorder that I was told he would have his whole life. 
Nicholas was also healed of allergies into susception and delayed immunity. Right now, I am entering hospice for fourth stage metastatic breast cancer, but it would be illogical not to believe that there is a God. You're listening to the Think Twice TV podcast. Many of the stories you've heard today are available in video format at our website, www.thinktwicetv.com. Find original videos, true life stories, and content to help you grow your faith at thinktwicetv.com. Anyone can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count the number of apples in a seed. It's time for the absolute basics of the Christian faith from seedbed.com. Answering those burning questions like who is God, what is salvation, and many more. So, let's take a bite. The absolute basics of the Christian faith. What is God like? So as we've discussed, God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons in one God. They're distinct in their personhood, but united in their very nature. Nature is a bit of a hard word, so let me explain that. Nature here means the kind of thing something is. Triangle's nature is to be a closed figure with three sides and three angles. Ice cream's nature is to be a frozen milk product. And giraffe's nature is to be a long-necked, even-toed, ungulate mammal. So what's God's nature? What kind of thing is God? Well, the best way to speak about God's nature is to say that God is, in every way, a perfect kind of thing. God's nature is whatever is best. St. Anselm, a medieval monk, describes God as supremely great. God is so great for Anselm that he's the greatest being we can think of. This is what we mean when we say that God is a perfect being. The idea of perfection is important because we are called not only to love God, but also to worship him. Worship means to offer total devotion. And only a perfect being is truly worthy of worship. Worshiping anything less than a perfect being is sinful. The Bible has a word for worshiping less than perfect things. It's called idolatry. This is why the psalmist says, For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The true God can't be a lesser deity with some powers. Zeus, for instance, from Greek mythology, has a lot of power through lightning bolts, but he didn't create lightning. Zeus isn't even eternal. According to mythological stories, Zeus has a father and came into being at a particular point in time. The only God worthy of worship is perfectly powerful, perfectly wise, good, and exists before everything as the creator of anything that exists. The Absolute Basics of the Christian Faith from Seedbed.com I would like to thank Seedbed.com and Dr. Philip Talon for allowing us to use some of the segments from The Absolute Basics of the Christian Faith. On audio, they are very descriptive, but they're even more amazing to see on video format. Uh, What they do is they have a book opened where they have um, an artist rendering these drawings and animating them to what is being told over the audio. I love this series because I am a visual learner. I love the drawings because they're very well made, they're funny, they keep your attention, and they help you learn these uh, truths that kind of sink in a little bit more once you have that picture in your head of what they're actually talking about. So there's 16 episodes, and they're all scripturally based. There's nothing that's out of line. Very well made. Highly recommend. I bought the whole set. So go to seedbed.com backslash confirmation. It's time for a bottle of Bill's Wisdom. A short, single-serving message of wisdom from our friend, Pastor Bill Leach. Larry Walker always wanted to fly. But poor eyesight disqualified him from, from pilot status in the Air Force. So one day he got an idea. He hitched up 45 helium-filled weather balloons to his lawn chair, strapped himself in, got some sandwiches, a pellet gun, and a six-pack of light beer. That tells you something about Larry Walters right there, Walker right there. His plan was to hover all 30 feet or so in the air for just a lazy afternoon, look around and uh, eat his sandwiches, enjoy his beer, and then he figured when he got tired of kind of lazily floating, he'd take the pellet gun and shoot some balloons until you know, it brought him back down to earth. But 45 weather balloons holding 33 cubic feet of helium apiece 
Do not settle for 30 feet. When his friends cut the cord anchoring his lawn chair to the ground, Larry shot up in the air like a, I don't, like a rocket. The lawn chair didn't level off at 30 feet, didn't level off at 100 feet, nor 1,000 feet. He stopped at 16,000 feet, only in Los Angeles. At this height, he was reluctant to shoot anything. And so he drifted with his beer and sandwiches into the airspace of Los Angeles International Airport. I would have given anything to be on a plane that day and have the pilot say, attention ladies and gentlemen, look out your left side of the airplane and you'll see, you'll see a man in a, in a lawn chair uh, hovering outside your window. In fact, uh, every radio communique from pilots either taking off or landing at LAX to the tower began with the same words, you're not going to believe this, but... After several hours, Larry decided he better risk shooting some balloons, and eventually he descended enough to get tangled up in some power lines where he was rescued. The FAA spokesman said after the event, we know he broke some part of the Federal Aviation Act, and as soon as we figure out which part it was, a charge will be filed. <laughs> As they led Larry away in handcuffs, a reporter asked him, why did you do this? And he replied, a man can't just sit there. <laughs> now, Larry may not score very high on the discretion scale. His story merited inclusion in the Darwin Awards. It's a book about people who, through incredibly stupid acts, elevate the IQ of the human race by eliminating themselves from the gene pool. Larry got only an honorable mention because he actually lived. But he is right about one thing. A man can't just sit there. We must have challenge, risk, adventure. Life is too short to just play it safe all the time. Now, I'm not advocating following Larry Walker's example by doing something impulsively stupid. You know, this isn't about going over Niagara Falls in a barrel or betting your life savings on the Detroit Lions. <laughs> that would be stupid, wouldn't it? You know, remember when the Lions were 0 16? I was driving to Detroit going a little too fast. Cop pulled me over, gave me two Lions tickets. <laughs> you know, it's not about doing something stupid, but it is about making life an adventure, some partnership with God, of getting out of the boat and do what Jesus is doing. After all, you know, there's no guarantee that life in the boat is any safer. I like what Eileen Guder wrote. She said, you can live on bland food so as to avoid an ulcer. Drink no tea or coffee in the name of health. Go to bed early and stay away from nightlife. Avoid all controversial subjects so as never to give offense. Mind your own business. Avoid involvements in other people's problems. Spend money only on necessities and save all you can said, you can still break your neck in the bathtub and it will serve you right. <laughs> Father, I pray that you'll take these concepts from your word and, and instill them deep in our spirits. Lord, help us not be casual about these truths. But help us to meditate on them and to seek your face on how to apply them to our own personal lives. Lord, we want to know you. We want to honor you. We want to praise you. We want to, we want to make you proud of us. We want, Lord, for one day we want to stand in your presence and hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to the podcast today. Our next episode is entitled, Saving Lives is God's Work. Kim's story 
suicidal teen turned around after a deadly crash, Carol's story, nearly murdered and rescued by God. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you next time. This venture is sponsored by Media Messengers Evangelistic Association, revealing the love and power of God through media, www.mediamessengers.org. If you like the show, follow us on social media, and please help us reach more people. All our social links are in the show notes.